Friends, brethren, family, welcome. I want to praise the Lord for your presence here tonight, and may God bless us and be with us. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to have just a short prayer, and then we're going to have a song, and Brother Stephan's going to read the scripture reading, and then we're going to get into the presentation. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, as your Sabbath comes, we pray your Holy Spirit would be with us to bless us. We pray this presentation would be a blessing, and we pray that your grace would lead and guide us. Let the presence of the angels be here. Rebuke any demonic spirits, Lord. Let them be cast away from us, and let the Spirit move. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Brother Stephan, please come. Yeah, you can read it from there if you wish. All right, we have Jeremiah, chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Now we'll be dealing with the, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. We'll be dealing with that last. But I thought it was an appropriate scripture to start with. Because it's a time where we're heading into. And these times kind of blend together. What we're going to be learning. One step after the other. But not ending, really, until... Well, one ending when Christ is finished in the sanctuary. The other ending when Jesus returns. Welcome to Prophet from Prophets presents The Shaking, the Sealing, and the Time of Jacob's Trouble. Amen. The angel said, get ready, get ready, get ready. Part one is the shaking. Now, what is the purpose of these studies, we might ask? So, uh, I'm going to read quite a few quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy and from the Bible, and we're going to learn what two uh, sources of information, these two sources of truth, tell us as Seventh-day Adventists what is going to be happening to us and what is coming in the near future. Now, Eloy says here something very interesting. There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep that constantly. No, she said constantly. She said didn't say not to keep it ever. All right, some people use that and say, see, we're not supposed to talk about it. We're not to preach about it. No, she said constantly, but not ever before the people and reign them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. There is to be a shaking among God's people, but this is not the present truth, the character of the churches. Now, mind you, this was written uh, in the 1890s, and the tone changes somewhat later. All right. She says here, Satan's object is accomplished just as surely when men run ahead of Christ and do the work he has never entrusted to their hand, as when they remain in the Laodicean state, lukewarm, feeling rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, the two classes are equally stumbling blocks. So in other words, there are those who are trying to run ahead of Christ. There are tro those who are lagging behind. Either one is just as deadly as the other. So we have to find that, that Holy Spirit middle ground, the Holy Spirit inspired middle ground where we are we are walking with the Lord. We are walking with Jesus. So the purpose of these studies is education. It's not sensationalism. And it's preparation, not hysteria. All right? So on the one hand, the things that we deal with are going to be heavy and invested with truth. And on the other hand, the things that we deal with are also God's love and His great mercy. So it should be an encouragement and a bit of a oomph, a spiritual Sometimes what we need is spiritual spanking, a little bit, a little spiritual tweaking to help us get us on our way. All right, let's continue. Okay, so what time are we in? What does Ellen White say? We are living in a time when life is most precious and most interesting. Indeed, I think we can find that we are living in such a time right now. The end of all things is at hand. Startling developments will continue to un unfolding before us, for unseen agencies are at work manifesting intense activity. Now, this is not just in the demonic sphere, it's also in the heavenly sphere. 
All right. Both agencies are working at utmost capacity for what is coming upon the earth. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And those things that cannot be shaken by the deceptions and delusions. Note what she says. By deceptions, which are lies, and delusions, which are false beliefs, all right, of these last days will remain. Rivet the soul to the eternal rock. For in Christ alone, there will be safety. There is no safety in our knowledge and in our faith, in our wealth, in our poverty, in our piety, in our, in our intellect, in our physical power. There is no safety in any of these things. There's no safety in our organization. There's no safety in numbers. There's no safety except Jesus Christ. Now, you know, it's easy to say that, but what does that mean? That means that all these things that I've just mentioned, while they may be good and useful, are not the grounds that we base our faith on but we're basing our faith upon what Christ himself has done for us. This was given in 1893. So she says, rivet to the rock, the soul to the eternal, rivet the soul to the eternal rock, for in Christ alone there will be safety. This is an anchor embedded in stone. The only way to get this anchor out of the stone is to break the stone. Will Jesus break? Mm -hmm. No. If you rivet your soul to this rock, it will never be broken. You will never lose. That's what it means to rivet the soul to the rock. When you rivet something, think of, you know, you're using those bolts, those heated bolts. You're driving it into the cement. You're driving deep into the stone. That thing will not move. No surface work, in other words, brethren. No surface faith, no pretend faith will make it. Only true faith is going to make it. All right. The shaking. That's what Ellen White says. We are in the shaking time. She says that's what we're in. We are in the shaking time. Okay. Let's take a look a little bit at concepts with regards to the shaking. Now, this is taken from Nehemiah. All right. Also, I shook my lap, says Nehemiah, and said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus be shaken out. And emptied, and all the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. So there's nothing new under the sun. The concept of a shaking is not new. It's not something strange. It's not something unbiblical. Okay, it happened in Nehemiah's day, where Nehemiah was saying that the people were to perform their duty. And if they didn't perform their duty, they were to be shaken out of the camp. They were to be removed from Israel, that is, lose their salvation. Okay, they were to be no longer numbered among the people. So, this is not something new. Shakings have happened before. The thing is, for Israel, is that we are in the final shaking. We are in the last shaking. The shaking just before Christ comes. That is where we are, and that is the difference. Uh, we can take a look at this material from 1869. Ellen White says the following. After the long, hard three weeks of unsuccessful labor in Battle Creek, I have felt that I must write out the things shown me in regard to the people at Battle Creek and let the people abroad have the reasons why we would not live at Battle Creek. So there was an issue why Ellen White did not want to live at Battle Creek. We knew that there was no liberty for the church till there should be a mighty break and perhaps one half shaken out. Half the church needed to be shaken out in order for the Lord to be able to work in the church. We know that from what God has shown us that a few in responsible positions have bound the church these years. So who was it that bound the church? Yes. It was the leadership that bound the church. If you read the Bible over and over again, it is the leadership that binds the church every single time. If the leader is good, then the people are good. And there's prosperity. If the leader is bad, then the people turn to evil and they turn to idolatry and it goes wrong. There is never a time when the leadership is good and the laity is bad. Well, I'll say only, only once under Moses. That was the only time when that happened. Everything else, you know it. You see it in the scriptures. The laity 
are not the ones holding it back, though they have a work to do. We have a work to do as laity. We have to, we have to let God into our hearts and let him work and, uh, and pray for our leaders. But brethren, and now we are aware that a terrible necessity alone, a terrible necessity alone will bring things to a point where there will be efforts made, zealous work to meet the minds of the Spirit of God. A terrible necessity. She understood that God at times works upon his people in a terrible necessity and that that wakes them up. And God removes leaders and he sets up new ones. And if they fail, they will be shaken out. And the process will continue until Christ comes. All right, not to belabor the point, but a shaking is normal and necessary. So similar situations have existed in the past, such as Nehemiah's day, in the recent past, such as our church history. And there's no reason to expect any different today. A shaking is required in order to allow God's plans for his people to proceed. Okay, I think that's pretty plain. All right. So Jesus and the shaking. Now, Jesus said one interesting thing. Well, he said many interesting things, but with regard specifically to this, he says this, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep, all right, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Jesus spoke of a shaking. Jesus told us how to prevent being shaken out. What does it say? We're supposed to do what? Dig deep in the foundation. What did Ellen White say? Rivet your soul to the rock. This is no surface work is the point. It's not a surface work. You have to let God dig deep into your heart. What else did Jesus say? He said, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell in the ruin of that house was great. Now, do you want to be a great ruin? Or do you want to be a great stone that will not move, riveted to the rock of Christ? That's what you want. That's what you want, brethren. That's what I want. So, building on the rock versus the sand. What does she say? Very interesting. I'm sorry to learn in reference to Brother Haynes. Also feel sad over Elder D.M. Canwright. Now, these are brothers that she was familiar with in her time. Okay, it's not too much the focus of exactly who they are at this moment. You can look that up. But anyways, it's, the, it's what happened that's important. She says, his mistake is just as I've written, because of his self-confidence and not digging deep. You see what she talks about? Several times she mentions that digging deep and laying his foundation upon the rock. This guy must have built on the sand, right? His foundation upon the rock, he uh, knew he would come to his present state sooner or later because he is not true religion. I'm sorry for Haynes. He had the same trouble, destitute of practical godliness. The result will be the same in every case that these represent. God's great sieve is shaking and will surely be shaken out. There is a chaff, and what is the chaff to the wheat? Now, it's interesting, in this statement, in 1880, that she incorporated Christ's parable on the house that is built on the sand and the house that is built on the rock and incorporated that into the shaking, okay? And she's saying he had the same trouble, destitute of practical godliness. You see, what happens often and what Ellen White talks about is those that know, but it doesn't allow it into the heart. There's no practical change. There's no real change. You're different. You're different in your exterior uh, appearance to everyone else. You appear one way, very pious, very something. And then at the same time, at home, you're a bear, you're nasty, and it, the, the, the work has not come into your heart. You understand what I'm saying? She is talking constantly about a deep work. As Job says, they are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. This is what will happen to many people in our church because they have not done the work. They have not allowed Christ to touch the heart. And that's the key, brother. We have to let Jesus in. Let Laodicea in church, it says of him, or the church, that Christ is knocking on the outside. I stand at the door and knock. If Christ stands at this door here and he knocks, is he in this room? No. He's not in the room. Okay, we have to let him in the room. All right, so what causes the shaking? Let's take a look. So one of them is false theories and doctrines. So Brother Haskell spoke 
uh, taking for his subject the sanctuary question, which is present truth. Macullus makes derision of the subject, thus showing that he uh, that the counsel given to him to seek to know more of the present truth and stating that he had only a superficial knowledge of it was correct. So she was saying that this man has only a superficial knowledge of the truth. He's not accepting the truth. And she was right. He knows very little of the precious truth for this time because he has not sunk the shaft deep. There it is again. You see, she speaks about that several times, not allowing the shaft deep into the heart. You can build a house on a rock but if you don't rivet it to the rock, off it goes. It's not just building on the rock, it's sinking deep, right? Into the mine of truth to discover precious ore. And what is the precious ore? The precious ore is the character of Jesus. That's the precious ore. The precious ore are fruits of the Spirit, love, mercy, gentleness, righteousness. Against those things there is no law. That is the precious truth. God's Spirit has illuminated every page of Holy Writ, but there are those upon whom it makes little impression. So you can, you can be reading it, but it's making very little impression on you. Your life isn't changing. Because it is imperfectly understood, when the shaking comes by the indoctrination of false theories, these surface readers, anchored nowhere, are like shifting sand. She uses that terminology over and over again. It's a theme. The shaking is associated with those who either put their, their faith deep in Christ or they build superficially on the sand. And if we don't put our hearts and our minds to the, to the work, we have to put our hearts and minds to work. And if we do that, we'll be digging deep. And if we don't, well, great will be the ruin of that house. So false uh, doctrines or theories are one of the things that are going to cause the shaking. And I think we're seeing that now. Uh, she says this with regards to false doctrines. She says, false theories will be mingled with every phase of experience and advocated with satanic earnestness in order to captivate the mind of every soul who is not rooted and grounded in full knowledge of the sacred principles of the word. Is that a superficial knowledge? What kind of knowledge does he say? Full, full, full knowledge of the sacred principles of the word. We have to have a full knowledge of those sacred principles. Superficial work will not, will not get us through. In the very midst of us will arise false teachers, giving heed to seducing spirits. So who's involved? We have satanic spirits that are involved in speaking to our leadership, in speaking to our teachers. There are evil spirits literally speaking to them, and they are taking the words that are spoken to them and then repeating it. That is what's happening. This is why we are where we are, because our institutions like, uh, like Loma Linda and like Andrews are overtaken by demonic spirits. That's why they're teaching what they're teaching. That's why homosexuality is running rampant in the church, because demonic spirits have taken over the leadership, and this is what is going on. These teachers will draw away disciples after them. Creeping in unawares, they will use flattering words and make skillful misrepresentations with seductive tact. Think about that. Skillful representation. Love is love. That is a skillful misrepresentation. It is a catchphrase that catches people and people don't know how to answer it. Well, water is water, but why don't you drink out of the toilet? Because love has a context and water has a context. Skillful misrepresentations, buzzwords, things that they will use to shut you down and make you be quiet because you don't know how to answer it. We have to become wise, wise as serpents to answer these evil things. So this is a modern fulfillment of the shaking. This gentleman, well, I use the term loosely, uh, is Desmond Ford. He's a former Seventh-day Adventist professor who taught that all the Old Testament prophecies found fulfillment in the first century A.D., that the year-day principle is not biblical, that multiple applications of the same prophecy exist, so the little horn could be Antiochus Epiphanes, the little horn is also pagan Rome, the little horn is also papal Rome, the little horn is also a future antichrist, basically it makes it completely ridiculous. The little horn could be anything you want. Sounds like a judgment. Well, exactly well it, it could very well be that he, was, that he was so. Christ begins his day of atonement ministry in AD 31. That's not what we believe. We believe in 1844 for the atonement ministry and disparaging the writings of the spirit of prophecy. Now Desmond Ford died uh, recently, I think in 2019, 
But uh, he was an Adventist theologian. He had a great uh, impact upon the church and a very negative impact upon the church because many people are in the church and still believe what this man teaches. This man was a heretic. He denied Christ in the end. And if he did, and if he did that right to his deathbed, he will not be in the kingdom of heaven. No one who denies the spiritual truths that we were given at Seventh-day Adventists is going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Not a one. God is not playing with us. This is serious. Doctrine is serious business. False doctrine leads to worshiping Satan. It's serious, brethren. There are false teachers, and Ellen White warned us that there would be. Now, what else causes the shaking? A straight testimony to the Laodicean church. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it was caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness, the Laodiceans. Now, who's the true witness? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. So, it is a counsel given by Jesus that is rejected by many. They're not rejecting just men. They're not rejecting just a message. They're rejecting Jesus Christ, the very Savior that died for them, that they profess to serve. But they're rejecting Him. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Brethren, vacillating, weak, cowardly, milk toast testimony will get you to hell. I'm going to say it again. That weak, toast, milk toast testimony will get you to hell because it shows that your heart is not right with God. It shows that you're not willing to stand for God when He tells you to stand. When God tells you to stand on one thing, you have to stand. It is a salvation issue. Now, God may forgive your weakness. He may forgive your failure. But constant rebellion won't make God hate you. But it'll make you hate God. And you will turn away from God. And that's the problem. It's not that God turns away from any one of us as long as that door is open. As long as there's a chance, Jesus keeps knocking. But when you tell him the final no, that's the last knock you'll ever hear. Mm -hmm. It's serious business. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. Uh, if you've seen my sermon, the Sunday Law Update, there was a... Uh, a gentleman who got a little bit hot under the collar, a conference worker who got a little hot under the collar because I had called Ted Wilson uh, a papist and as well as Genugdia. And I was speaking against the leadership, is what he's saying, against the leadership. And then he said, I cannot speak against the leadership. And I said, yes, I can. And yes, we should. When the leadership is doing wrong, they need to be admonished. They need to be told that right is right and wrong is wrong for their salvation. It's not because we hate them. It's because we love them. Jesus told the hard truth. He stepped on toes because he loved people, not because he hated them. It is not hate to tell the truth. That is a liberal lie. That is a lie of liberalism. That is a misconception of the devil. All right. We have to speak the straight testimony. It will cause a shaking and then let it cause a shaking. Let it cause divisions. It needs to cause division. God doesn't want some of these people in the church because some of them are outright agents of Satan and they will never turn. God will cause a shaking through the straight testimony and people will leave because they can't handle it and they don't want to hear it. Now another cause of the shaking is going to be the mark of the beast. What clouds of chaff will then be borne away by the fan of God? where now our eyes can discover only rich floors of wheat. How many millions of members are there? Was it 25 million, 27 million, something like that? Uh, where our eyes can only discover only rich floors of wheat, will the chaff blow away with a fan of God? While many who have appeared to be flourishing trees, but who have borne no fruit. Now that's a key. That's a key. They have borne no fruit. What is fruit? Love, mercy, Patience, gentleness, meekness, against which there is no law. If you're bearing fruit, it's not a gift, but a fruit, you know you have Jesus in your heart and he's working on you. And that's good news. But if you're not bearing any fruit, if there's no change in your life, Ellen White says that Satan loves to have the gospel preached as long as there is no corresponding change in your life. Preach that gospel, preacher. 
because the people don't care. They love the, the sound, but they're going to go home the same, unchanged. But who have borne no fruit will go with the multitude to do evil and will receive the mark of apostasy in the forehead and the hand. This was going to cause a shaking among us. It needs to shake. The church needs to be divided because there are people that are not of the body. Okay, they're in the body, but they're not part of the body. They're a cancer. Now, it's not my job or your job to go find out, you know, to rip up the wheat and the tares. But there are obvious apostasies that we cannot tolerate in the church. All right? There are obvious apostasies, like feminism. The ideology of feminism is a cancer. It is a moral cancer in society. It is a societal cancer, and it is a cancer in the church. The right relationship between men and women is established in Scripture, and feminism destroys it. So these are the types of things that we need to be very aware of. We need to be concerned about. We need to say no. We are not going to react in this way. And the world will say, you're crazy, you're sexist, you're racist, you're homophobic. You know what? They spit on Jesus. They called him all kinds of names. They crucified him. They threw him out of the church. And Jesus says, follow in my footsteps. If they do this to me, they'll do it to you. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It means you're following in my footsteps. If we stand for the truth, okay? I'm not saying that we need to be mean or angry or bitter. None of that. Jesus was none of those things. But he would not let evil go. He would not let it pass. Another cause of the shaking. In every religious crisis, some fall under temptation. The shaking of God blows away multitudes like dry leaves. Friends, is this like one or two that's going to leave the church? Multitudes. <sighs> like dry leaves. Like leaves in the wind. Gone. Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Not people with PhDs. Okay, People who profess the truth. But adversity purges them out of the church. Adversity, which is coming, is going to be a blessing. And I'm not going to feel like it's a blessing. It may not feel like it's a blessing right now or right when it happens, but it's necessary. The surgeon has to cut the excess, the tumorous cancer that is eating the heart of the church. God will do it. Now, now, I'll read the finish, I'll read the finish, and then I'll, I'll say something else. As a class, these spirits, or their spirits are not steadfast with God. They go out from us because they're not of us. For when the tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, many, be offend, many are, are offended. Now, when she talked about the preaching of the uh, Laodicean message, did she, was she saying that angels were going to do that? No. Who's going to do that? We. People are going to do that. You and I are going to do that. It's not going to be a light coming down from heaven and saying, oh, I have the Laodicean message, and that's shaking people out. No, it's people that God himself is raising up, speaking that message. And Oh, you're divisive. Yeah, I'm divisive only because I'm telling you what God has to say, what God wants you to hear. The reality is I'm not being divisive towards God. I'm being divisive towards Satan. And if you have that, pro that problem, that means you're being accepting of Satan, and you're being divisive towards God. God is going to divide the church. God is going to split the church. God is going to come in through his fan and he will shake this floor and he will blow away the leaves. Amen. It's going to happen. It is happening. The world is aligning themselves ideologically with people who are willing to coerce your conscience and those who are willing to stand up for liberty. Brethren, we have to be able to stand up for liberty, for liberty of conscience, liberty of truth. We need to do this. If we don't, we are standing on the side of the black flag of Satan. So when does the, shirk, the shaking occur? Okay, now we read uh, earlier a, a short uh, piece that Ellen says, we are now in the shaking. So let's take a look at what she's saying. At times I'm worried in the spirit, but when I commit all to God, his peace comes to me. I hear his voice saying, be still and know that I'm God. I see that the time has come. When everything that can be shaken will be shaken. We are in the shaking time. Be assured that only those who live the prayer of Christ working out in the practical life will stand the test. 1900. Okay. Remember before it's 1890 and she's talking about this isn't a present truth. Well, she's talking more about it. It's becoming present truth. 
Okay, the shaking is becoming present truth because we are presently in the shaking and it's getting worse. So this is now becoming a present truth. We are in the shaking time. So now it's a present truth. We are in it. Okay, before she was talking more forward looking. Now she's like, and this is the shaking. Not just a shaking within the church, you know, God trying to remove a certain section, but this is the shaking. All right? So it occurs now. Is when it's occurring. It's occurring now since her time. All right? So uh, another thing, when does the shaking occur? What else does she say? There is a spirit of desperation, of war, and of bloodshed, a spirit that will increase until the very close of time. So we're going to have more peace? We're not going to have more peace. We're going to have more war. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in the forehead. Now this is interesting. It is not any seal or mark. Now we're going to deal with the seal later. Okay? But just, just bear with me. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it's begun already. So the sealing and the shaking are working together. They began in Ellen White's day, because this statement is from 1902. Okay, so they began in Ellen White's day. So that means that these things progress. They have a beginning where it starts and then it get, builds and it builds and it builds. So the shaking is progressive in intensity and its scope. And as we near the close of time to the Mark of the Beast from 1844, it increases. Okay, until we get to the red zone, which we're heading to now, I think. I think, we're very, I think we're in the beginnings of this red zone, maybe that, that little gold part there and now heading into the red. Mm -hmm. But that's where we're heading. It is an increase. So will the church fall? Let's see. We're to be ready and waiting for the orders of God. Nations will be stirred to their very center. I know it's a lot of information, brethren. You're being, you're being very good in paying attention. So I hope that you're able to follow what I'm, what I'm saying. All right. Nations will be stirred to their very center. Nations will be stirred to their very center. What's the center of a nation? The government. Okay? Nations will be stirred, stirred to their very center. The governments. Some governments may collapse. New governments may come. Revolutions may happen. She talks about the spirit of the French Revolution. Did that shake the nation of France to its center? Oh, it did. And there was piles and piles of bodies and buckets and buckets and rivers of blood. It was a very deadly, very terrible time. And Ellen White tells us we should be looking at going to places away from others. And I know God wants us to do that, each one of us, and he is leading us to do that, each in their own place. Don't fear, don't fret, God will open a door. But that's what he's asking us to do, to pull away from the world, to start disentangling yourself. Because if you don't do it now, when it happens, it's too late. Okay, it's too late for you because you already know to disentangle. You already know to let go. If you don't let go now, well, you'll be caught up. Even though you know. Remember, these people know the truth, but they have no fruit of letting go from the world, and they get caught up. All right. She says, And all who will not bow to the decree of the national councils and obey the national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by the man of sin to be disparaged of God's holy day will feel not the oppressive power of popery alone, but the Protestant world, the image of the beast. Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear to be about to fall. Now we get into this one that we have heard often, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separate from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. So it's in the context, this statement is in the context of the Mark of the Beast crisis. As the mark of the beast crisis increases, so does persecution increases. Just like, she, just like she said, adversity purges out these professors, these false uh, you know, uh, professors, false Christians. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouth. We must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. This is the righteousness of Christ's message. Because if you rivet your soul to the rock, what does that mean? Confess your sin to God. Yes. Tell him that you're weak. Tell him that you don't even want to be saved. Because the carnal heart doesn't want to be saved. You have to admit it. Your carnal heart hates God. It is by nature a thing of wrath. 
We don't want to be saved. Even God himself had to put that will and that power in our own hearts. Nothing that we do, nothing that we say saves us. It's only what Jesus does. But we have to cooperate with him. We have to cooperate with him. Friends, if God is stepping on your toe tonight, remember that he has stepped on mine. He has stepped on mine. And it's not because he hates me. It's because he loves me. And he doesn't want to use the rod. He does not want to use the rod. He does not want to do this. But he will do it. He will burn down our institutions if he has to do it to get our attention like he did to the Battle Creek Sanitarium and to the Review and Herald building. The strange fires that Adventists have in their buildings, when you put water on it, it just gets hotter and burns faster. God doesn't want to have to do this. But God will move with terrible things in righteousness. The hour is late. The hour is late. Not just the hour right now. <laughs> but the hour in the world is late, brethren. The days of purification. When God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, who will then be able to stand? Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. How many? Majority. A majority. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. Few. This will be our test. And that's a test. Because God says, I don't want you to lean on numbers. I don't want you to have this big army. God wants everyone to be saved. But in the final test, he's going to prune that tree. And there will only be a few choice fruits, a few choice leaders, a few choice people to move forward with vision, with understanding, with godly fear. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel, sorry, the great rebel leader. The days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. God will have a people pure and true. In the mighty sifting soon to take place, he's talking about the shaking, we will better be able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that their time is near when the Lord will manifest his fan is in his hand and he, that soon, and he will soon thoroughly purge his floor. He will thoroughly purge his floor. These men... These are Daniel's friends. They stood. They stood alone. They stood for Christ, knowing that they would get thrown into a fiery furnace. We are not given the faith of martyrs until it's necessary. But when the time comes, brethren, I pray we have it. I pray we have it so we are not lost. Jesus doesn't want us to be lost. Look, this isn't fun. This isn't, this isn't a game. This is the truth. This is righteousness. This is what Christ wants us to do to stand. The shaking is not just God's people. It's not just God's people. The wicked cities are shaken. The end is near and every city is to be turned upside down every way. Every city is to be turned upside down every way. Governments are going to be at the center shaken. Cities are going to be at the center shaken. All right? There will be confusion in every city. Has there been confusion in cities the last, time, last while? Things that people are, where is all this confusion coming from? Riots after riot after riot. Streets filled with homeless people. Drugs, crime, burnings. Confusion, destruction. There will be confusion in every city. Everything that can be shaken is to be shaken, and we do not know what will come next. Does that sound like a peaceful time? It sounds like our time. You don't know what's good. You don't, you don't know what you turn on the news the next day. Another thing. Another crazy thing has happened. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they have had. 1902. Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities. Now almost given to idolatry. 1903. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. 1910. It gets increasingly worse. Increasingly worse. 
We have a work to do in the cities, from the country, <laughs> where we're supposed to be able to go to the cities and speak the truth, and then leave and come back and bring people with us. It's not just to go preach the truth, it's to help people, because people are going to get kicked out of their homes. Children are going to get kicked out of their homes. Elderly are going to get kicked out of their homes. Parents are going to get kicked out of their homes by their children, because the state's going to give the, the children power, because the parents want to follow the Lord. We have to build places. We have to uh, think about others. So prepare. Even, even if you can't go somewhere right now, just prepare to help someone, one person. And God, let God move you and help you, and he will show you the way how to do this. But the cities will be shaken, and they need to be warned. We're coming near the close, brethren. Don't worry. I won't keep you too much longer. Though Jesus Christ show that you are worthy of the sacred trust with which the Lord has honored you in bestowing upon you life and grace, you are to refuse to be in subjection to the power of evil. As soldiers of Christ, we must deliberately and intelligently accept his terms of salvation under every circumstance, cherish rights, princi cherish right principles, and act upon them. Divine wisdom is to be a lamp to your feet. Be true to yourselves. Be true to your God. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but rooted and grounded in the truth. There, that rooting, that grounding again. Okay? You will abide with those things that cannot be shaken. Do you want to abide with those things that cannot be shaken? Amen. Raise your hand. Amen. 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 We want to abide with those things which cannot be shaken. Can Christ be shaken? No. He can never be shaken. Can the Father be shaken? No. no. Can the indwelling of the Holy Spirit ever be shaken? No. no. Can the angels ever be shaken? No. no. Because they all abide in Christ, they all abide in God. And God cannot be shaken, and we will not be shaken if we do not refuse the entrance of Christ into our heart. Amen. Okay, he is knocking. Let him in. Let's let him in. Oh, I want to read that last bit. The law of God is steadfast, unalterable, for it is the expression of the character of Jehovah. Every attempt that Satan will make in false doctrine attacks his law. It'll lead you to the false Sabbath. It'll lead you to breaking every other law. So beware. Someone comes with a message and saying, hey, this is a message from God and leads you away from the truth and the law. Liar. No matter how many miracles they do in front of you. Make up your mind that you will not, by word of influence, cast the least dishonor upon its authority. By our actions and by our words, we are to uphold that law. And it's, it incumbent on, we are all, we all affect each other. Okay? We all influence each other here. And we need to influence each other for good and not evil. Right? To help each one another. Pray for each other. Remember each other in prayer. Mm -hmm. Look for ways to help one another. And that's how we grow as a church. That's how the world sees that we love each other. Okay? It's not about infighting and bickering. Ah, oh, you're doing this and... You had two scoops of ice cream. And, you know, that, that's not the point. But the point is to support each other, to love one another, to really, when you see something wrong, go to that brother, go to that sister, pray with them, love them. Tell them you're not against them. You want to help them. Rivet to the rock. Rivet the soul to the eternal rock. For in Christ alone, there will be safety, brethren. In Christ alone, there will be safety. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the brethren here today. I, I pray that I haven't burdened them too much. I pray your Holy Spirit will lead and guide them. Bless us as we enter into your Sabbath soon. May your angels be at our side to give us wisdom to overcome the things that are coming upon the world. And Lord, give us the Holy Spirit. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And may your Spirit come upon this small company in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.